Here's what's coming up on the world today. The United States rolls out the first set of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines across the country. Meanwhile, the country's electoral college votes in the final step in the country's electoral process. Plus, the European Commission president says the UK and the EU are in the very last mile of Brexit talks. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. It's a big day in the U.S. today as the first COVID-19 vaccinations approved for public use in the country are taking place. The U.S. is gearing up for its largest ever vaccination campaign with the aim of reaching 100 million people by the month of April. Here's more in our global update. Chester, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Health officials in the United States have begun what's considered a hugely complicated task of distributing the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine nationwide, a move held as extraordinary. While it was earlier planned that members of the Trump administration would be among the first to get the vaccine, the U.S. President Donald Trump claims to have changed that position, saying he would rather Americans got it first. Officials say some of the first vaccines would, however, be reserved for those who work in close proximity to President Trump. The first three million doses are being distributed to dozens of locations in all 50 states. In Russia, medical workers in the Siberian city of Omsk have started receiving coronavirus vaccine shots after a shipment of a thousand potions of Sputnik V arrived in the city on Friday. Medics are among the first to get vaccinated as Russia pushes a larger scale of vaccination amid the coronavirus pandemic. Meanwhile, the first deliveries of COVID-19 vaccines have arrived in Canada with the first Canadians likely to be receiving the jabs from today. Canada and the United States are set to become the first Western nations after the UK to begin inoculations with the vaccine developed by Pfizer and Germany's BioNTech. The initial 30,000 doses will go to 14 sites around Canada. The most vulnerable people, including the elderly, in long-term care facilities and healthcare workers will be the first in line. And Singapore has become the first Asian country to approve the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine and says it expects to start receiving shots by the end of the year. The Prime Minister says he would be among the early recipients. The government says it expects to have secured enough vaccines for everyone by the third quarter of 2021. If all goes according to plan, we'll have enough vaccines for everyone in Singapore by the third quarter of 2021. VOA Steve Baragona joins us now. He's in Washington. Steve, thank you for joining me. How is the vaccination going today across the U.S. as far as you know? So far, so good. Uh, the first vaccine doses have been delivered. Uh, we've seen some pictures from Queens in, uh, in New York City of healthcare workers getting vaccinated. Uh, but it's just the beginning. There's going to be uh, about 3 million doses going out in the next few days. Um, the uh, Operation Warp Speed, the, uh, the U.S. government program to, uh, to get the vaccine out, has 145 distribution centers to get to today, uh, another 425 tomorrow, another 66 on Wednesday. So it's a big job. There's a lot of moving parts, but um, so far, so good. Now, this is a long-awaited vaccine that has arrived, and yet a number of people are still skeptical about receiving it. And 
when you consider the deaths in the United States and the number of coronavirus cases, are authorities addressing these concerns, um, probably pushing reason why people should be willing to take the vaccine? Well, there is a, uh, a an advertising campaign that is planned that has started rolling out to try to uh, to convince people. Um, it's been there's been some questions about it, a little bit of controversy. Uh, the uh, White House wanted to include some kind of questionable celebrities uh, with kind of uh, pro-Trump uh, slants that uh, got them into trouble. Um, but there, you know, there is this this kind of effort to uh, to get people on board. Uh, but it's not going to be easy. I mean, there is uh, uh, this level of skepticism that you referenced. Um, right now, I think what we're seeing is about, depending on the survey, about fifty to sixty percent of people say that yes, they will get it. Um, you have maybe a, a 20%, 30% maybe hardcore who say they won't. Um, but I think a lot of it is going to depend on how the rollout goes. I mean, if everything goes well, we've got a vaccine that uh, that the companies say is 95% effective. Um, a lot of folks are saying, you know, those, you know, people could change their minds once they see that it that it uh, works and it's safe. Um, you know, we'll see how it goes, but uh, but that really could be a, a major factor in in determining how many people actually get shots in the arm. Yeah, and of course you have to monitor the side effects that accompany the vaccine. Uh, but speaking of President Trump, the White House has backed down from being among the first to receive the vaccine. President Trump says, you know, he would rather everyone else got it, uh, not the White House. Is that him being selfless, or this is skepticism? Uh, uh, you know, the kind of skepticism well, we're finding outside, you know, of the White House. It, well, it's it's very difficult to know what goes on in the mind of the president, but we do know that that Friday he was pressuring the FDA to approve the vaccine. Uh, he called the the agency a slow turtle, um, it, even though it, they were maybe 12 hours away from approving the vaccine. So. On the one hand, there is this kind of uh, perception that the, the White House is pushing as hard as possible to get the vaccine out there. Um, it, you know, the, the, the White House has been skeptical about a lot of the prevention measures, but has never really been skeptical about the vaccine itself. This has been kind of their, the one thing that they've been really pushing very hard for. So I, again, I it's, it's impossible to know what goes on inside the president's mind, but um, I think we have some reason to think that, um, that they, they don't have the same skepticism about the vaccine that we've seen elsewhere. Indeed, and President Trump did keep his promise, we might add, uh, promising Americans a vaccine before the end of the year. Just thought to put that out there. Steve, thanks again for joining us on the program, and do stay safe. Absolutely. I'm going to stay a bit more in the United States. As the Treasury and Commerce Departments claim there's been an attack on their communications. FireEye, a company that provides U.S. government cybersecurity, says it identified the problem after its own hacking tools were stolen last week. And that governments, technology and telecom organizations across North America, Europe, Asia and the Middle East had all fallen victim to a global campaign employing top-tier operations, tradecraft and resources. And this was consistent, FireEye says, with state-sponsored attackers patiently conducting reconnaissance and consistently covering their tracks. Interestingly, today is still an important date in the United States, not just because of the rollout of the vaccines, but because electors from 50 states and the District of Columbia are gathering across the country, casting their ballots, which will confirm Joe Biden as the rightful 46th president and Kamala Harris as vice president. President Trump is yet to accept Joe Biden, won both popular and electoral votes, and is still hoping to turn things around. So today's events will test how long this fantasy can continue. We'll be coming back to this story in a bit, uh, but Sudan is officially now off the list. The U.S. list, that is, of state sponsors of terrorism. According to his embassy in Khartoum, the congressional notification period of 45 days has lapsed and the Secretary of State has signed a notification stating recession, rescission of Sudan's state sponsor of terrorism designation is effective from today. U.S. President Donald Trump had in October said Sudan will come off the list after it pays compensation of $335 billion to victims and families of al-Qaeda's 1998 bombing of U.S. embassies in Africa. Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok had responded by saying 
of funds had been transferred. The country was listed in 1993 when al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden lived there as a guest of the government. It was along with Iran, North Korea and Syria. A Brexit still in the works, and we'll be revisiting that story in a bit. But the world faces its worst health and economic crisis in over a century. It seems like the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating inequality. That's according to French President Emmanuel Macron, who was speaking at the 60th anniversary of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD for short. He encouraged world leaders to share resources and knowledge, emphasizing that the crisis had revealed the industrial, commercial, and financial interdependence of world economies. Mr. Macron also took the opportunity to call for a fairer tax system on the revenues of internet giants like Google, Amazon, and Facebook. The Paris-based OECD makes economic policy recommendations and provides outlooks for the global economy. It currently has 37 member countries, including G7 economies. So, indeed, the U.S. Electoral College has begun voting, and uh, they will be determining, finally, if uh, Joe Biden is still the 46th president of the United States. Not sure anything else can happen at this point. Our correspondent in Washington, Maria Burr, joins us now to clear things up for us. Maria, great to see you. First of all, explain to our viewers how important the Electoral College is, especially in light of how the electoral process has gone this year. I'm Raj, it's great to see you as well. Thank you for having me. This electoral college um, is an old tradition. Um, and I say tradition because the fact that it's something that really, I think, um, has gone its day. Um, we're in a position now where we would not be surprised if we don't see some referendums and some legislation brought forth um, to move us away from the Electoral College. This is normally an act that occurs each and every election cycle which really goes unnoticed because it really goes after what that state has voted. And so typically an electoral college vote will go in the way in which the people of that state voted. Um, and then that ballot will be cast. And so we won't see any change um, in the actual election results. And so this year, obviously, uh, many people are biting their nails a little bit, but we, we can't foresee how this would at all change any of what has been uh, projected as the election results for the next president of the U.S. If I'm hearing you correctly, Maria, it means the Electoral College only mirrors Election Day voting. So nothing really changes. Um, I, I know, as you said, no biting going on, but um, really nothing changes. We're expecting all of the electoral officers to vote just as the elections, as elections turned out. Is that what you're saying? That is exactly what is supposed to happen. Now, again, um, this has started out in the beginning of the kind of the starting of our constitution because many people didn't believe that those who were casting ballots were as intellectually astute about politics and about what was best for the country. So they had individuals that had these electoral votes to be able to kind of cast a ballot. But again, this has just been a formality um, over the past few years. And so uh, we're hopeful that even though the Republican Party is standing with President Trump in all these lawsuits, we will not see anything occur today that will be any different than what the Constitution and what we have seen in years past. Maria, very quickly, I know Hillary Clinton is amongst uh, one of the officers. Any other celebrity guests? Um, at this time, we are not expecting many other celebrity guests. Typically, these are individuals uh, who are your everyday person in your community uh, that have been put into this role of this of, of this position. So this is typically a very non-political role, but we know that she is one that um, will be taking some attention today. Maria, thanks again, and uh, do keep us informed as to the progress of things in the U.S. And, of course, stay safe. Thank you for having me. Stay with us. Still ahead, can Santa still make it to people's homes this Christmas despite the coronavirus? Well, we don't want Santa to fall ill. More so, we don't want anything to happen to our presents this Christmas. How to keep Santa safe this year? That's up next. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the program. Talks are continuing today between the UK and the EU over a post-Brexit trade deal as they search for a breakthrough in securing an agreement. While Prime Minister Boris Johnson says both sides remain far apart in key areas, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says they're both at the very last mile. It's another day of Brexit talks in Brussels. On Sunday, both sides agreed to go the extra mile in the coming days to try to reach a trade agreement, despite missing their latest deadline to avert a turbulent split in trading ties at the end of the month. The European Union's Brexit negotiator said today that selling a new trade pact with Britain is still possible as negotiators seek to break deadlocks on access to UK fishing waters for EU vessels and corporate economic fair play rules. And is that near? He later briefed ambassadors on the state of trade agreements, tweeting that the next days would be important for a deal. In the meantime, Londoners are confident Brexit negotiators will manage to seal a trade pact before the UK's final break with the European Union on December the 31st. While gaps have been narrowing after several months of talks, it is not clear if Britain and the EU would be able to clinch an agreement with less than three weeks left or face economic damage from a no deal from January the 1st. Read Asia now, where leaders of protesting Indian farmers have begun a one-day hunger strike against agricultural reforms that they say threaten their livelihoods, stepping up pressure on Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government to withdraw the legislation. Farmers have been demonstrating for nearly three weeks against deregulation of the agriculture sector that will allow them to sell produce to buyers beyond government's regulated wholesale markets where growers are assured a minimum price. Small growers fear the changes, part of Modi's liberalization, liberal, liberalizing reforms, will mean that at the end of price support for staples such as wheat and rice will leave them at the mercy of big businesses. Reforms containing three laws enacted in September loosen rules around the sale, pricing and storage of farm produce Six rounds of talks between government officials and farmers union leaders have failed to resolve one of the most pressing issues facing Mr. Modi's government. China's President Xi Jinping says he is, his country is willing to work with other countries to advance the international cause of poverty reduction and building a community with a shared future for mankind. The Chinese president made this known in a letter of congratulations to the International Forum on Sharing Poverty Reduction Experience, which opened in Beijing on Monday. In the letter, Mr. Xi pointed out that it is a common wish of mankind to eradicate poverty, and the Communist Party of China and the Chinese government have always taken it as their goal to let the people live a better life and made the long-term arduous efforts to this end. Based on previous achievements in poverty alleviation, China launched an all-round fight against poverty since 2012. After eight years of efforts, the president says all poor rural people under the current standard have shaken off poverty and all poor countries have been lifted out of poverty this year. Turkey has detained 11 people suspected of being involved in the abduction and smuggling to Iran of an Iranian dissident wanted by Tehran in connection with a deadly 2018 attack in southwestern Iran. A senior official says Habib Chab, an Iranian ethnic Arab separatist leader, was drugged and kidnapped by networking working on behalf of Iran's intelligence service after being lured into flying to Turkey by an Iranian intelligence operative. Iran state media said in November that Iranian intelligence ministry officers arrested Chaab over suspected involvement in a 2018 attack on a military parade that killed dozens of people without saying when or how he was detained. Turkish officials say Chaab, who has been in Sweden, was persuaded to fly to Turkey to meet a woman who, unknown to him, worked for Iranian intelligence. Our kids around the world might not be able to meet Santa Claus in person this year. Many companies are embracing technology as a way to bring festive cheer to children while maintaining coronavirus safe social distancing. London events company Boo Productions is one of many companies offering children a chance to log on to meet Santa Claus instead 
of sitting on his knee. Entertainment company Ministry of Fun, which has been training Santas for over 25 years, has also created Santa HQ, a virtual app for kids, and the company even ran special training classes for Santas on the new digital experience, helping them to practice making one to one video calls. In addition, US company StoryFile has come up with an AI alternative, creating a website where children can ask Santa questions online instead. Kids log on and ask the virtual Santa Claus a question, and the system's algorithm replies with an appropriate answer even to some of the trickier coronavirus related questions. And then in other parts of the world, Santa Claus has also met the challenges of the pandemic, including at a mall in Rio de Janeiro, where a life-sized video screen beams a behind-the-scenes Santa to visiting kids. And at a zoo in Denmark, Santa greets children from inside a COVID-secure giant snow globe. This whole concept is, is amazing. And what better way for a child to be able to interact with Santa in such a challenging time, for, for any length of time, um, in the comfort of their own home? Kids are all over the country and all over the world are not going to be able to sit on Santa's lap and talk to him and ask questions and have that experience for Christmas. So I said, who better to bring Santa to life and all of these kids can ask him questions and talk to him and tell him what they want. I feel this year we have to accept that Christmas is going to be a bit different. And that's why we've created the Santa HQ app. It's, I, I'm not kind of thinking of it as a sort of second best thing at all. Because actually, children spend a long time uh, looking at iPads and talking to their friends through their smartphones, etc., etc. So actually, for a child, meeting Father Christmas on a screen is actually quite a natural and normal thing. Sure, many of those kids will be looking forward to the presents this year. Let's hope nothing happens to them. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.